Hello, everybody. Thank you for attending my talk. Uh, my name is Keith Knauer. I'm a student of Bernard Kipling's research group, and uh, I'm a recipient of the Cope Fellowship in 2014. And I'd like to discuss the research that I did that led to the reception of that fellowship. Um, the title of my talk is High Performance Inverted Top Emitting Electrophosphorescent Organic Light Emitting Diodes. Uh, here's a, an outline of the talk. So my hope is that you walk away with both an understanding of the research I did, but um, in addition, an understanding of the technology of organic light emitting diodes, how it works, and what the major application areas are. So I'd like to motivate the talk with applications. Um, there are two major applications for organic light emitting diodes. The first and major application area is full color high definition displays such as cell phones and television screens and the second is solid state uh, lighting. So what is an organic light emitting diode and how do they work? An organic light emitting diode is an electroluminescent device that consists of organic semiconducting material placed between two electrodes an anode and a cathode. Their operation can be described by four high-level steps as shown in the diagram. The first step is carrier injection, where electrons are injected from the cathode and holes are injected from the anode. The second step is that under the influence of an electric field, these charges migrate toward the center of the organic material between the two electrodes. Um, these charges become coulombically attracted uh, in an excited state known as an exciton. And these excited states can decay, um, resulting in the emission of the photons that you see. Modern day OLEDs are multi layer devices with a total thickness of about 200 nanometers. Each of the layers within the OLED is chosen um, with a specific function in mind. The electrodes are materials with work functions that promote the injection of their respective carrier. In the case of the anode, it's holes. In the case of the cathode, it's electrons. The injection layers are chosen to either modify these work functions or to provide some surface doping effect to enhance the injection of the carriers from the electrodes into the transport layers. The transport layers are materials with mobility values that allow for the balanced um, transport of carriers into the emissive layer where excitons are created and radiatively relax with the desired color. Here's an example of an energy diagram that can be drawn for organic semiconducting materials. Um, we draw these with what are called homo bands and LUMO bands. Uh, the HOMO band stands for highest occupied molecular orbitals, and the LUMO band stands for lowest unoccupied molecular orbitals. Holes are transported through the HOMO states within the HOMO band, and electrons are transported within the LUMO states of the LUMO band. Also shown on this diagram are the quantities of electron affinity, which is just the difference in energy between the vacuum level and the LUMO level and the ionization energy, uh, which is the difference between the vacuum level and the HOMO level. Um, at the bottom of the slide, there are some example hole and electron transport materials for you to get an idea of the chemical diagrams um, of these materials. And from these diagrams, you can get a general feel for why we choose the materials that we do. Um, we generally look for low injection barriers and high mobility values for our materials because we want low voltage operation. We want as high of an internal quantum efficiency as possible, which is just the ratio of internally generated photons to the carriers injected. And finally, you want as high of an outcoupling efficiency as possible, which is the ratio of photons that are extracted from the OLED to the number of photons that are internally generated. And uh, in this way, you'll get the highest, effic highest efficiency and lowest voltage operation. There's a classification for OLEDs that can be made based on the position of their electrodes. In the left diagram, there's a so-called conventional OLED, which only means that 
the cathode is on the top of the device and the anode is on the bottom of the device. In an OLED in the so-called inverted architecture, the cathode is on the bottom of the device and the anode is on top. My work has primarily focused on inverted OLEDs, which have an advantage of allowing them to be more conveniently fabricated on the predominantly electron injecting electronics that are used in displays. Inverting these OLEDs has also allowed us to take advantage of where the light exits the OLED. Um, OLEDs can be either bottom emitting or top emitting, as shown in the diagram below, but there are some advantages to top emitting OLEDs. In bottom emitting OLEDs, the light has to exit through a transparent substrate such as glass and a semi-transparent bottom anode, which is typically indium tenoxide. And in exiting through these substrates in a bottom emitting OLED, a lot of the light is trapped. Up to 75% of the light, in fact, can be trapped. So making them top emitting um, helps to avoid trapping within these uh, transparent substrates and bottom emitting devices. Also, we've moved away from indium tenoxide electrodes in favor of thin metals, which allows us um, the advantage of using these in flexible applications. Also, top emitting OLEDs can be used on opaque substrates. And um, specifically in displays, again, as shown in the diagram below, you can maximize the emissive area uh, because you can have the OLED extend over the driving electronics in an active matrix display, uh, maximizing the so-called pixel aperture ratio and allowing you to extend the lifetime of the OLED because you don't have to drive each individual OLED very hard to, um, to attain a desired brightness on a screen. Here's a simple flowchart of the fabrication process that's used to make these OLEDs. I'll cut one inch by one inch glass slides and clean them through ultrasonication in different baths, uh, distilled water and soap, distilled water, acetone, and then IPA. Take those one inch by one inch glass slides, plasma treat them uh, in an O2 plasma system, spin coat P dot PSS. This is a polymer that after it's deposited on the glass, um, basically helps to allow for the cathode that's later deposited to be deposited very smoothly on the glass substrate. After the P-dot PSS is annealed, those substrates are loaded into a thermal evaporator and pumped down to a base pressure of lower than 3 times 10 to the minus 7 torr, where this evaporation process is then sequentially done to evaporate each of the layers. And finally, um, when the devices are unloaded, they're unloaded directly into a nitrogen-filled glove box. This nitrogen atmosphere uh, protects the OLEDs from oxygen and water, which would have a deleterious effect on their performance. Before I show my results, I'd like to explain the metrics for the data. The first is luminance, which can be thought of analogously to brightness. The equation for it is shown here. It's the spectral radiance um, integrated against the photopic response, which is the response of the human eye to visible light, um, integrated across the visible spectrum and multiplied by 683 lumen per watt. The unit is candela per meter squared. And in the red box, I've shown some devices that uh, you are familiar with, with some luminance values that they're typically operated at, so you, you have some context for this number. And also, um, the efficiency metric that I re report is called current efficacy, which is uh, reported in candela per amp. And it's the ratio of the luminance to current density. Historically, there's been a major challenge in making highly efficient inverted OLEDs, and this challenge is the difficulty of injecting electrons into the device. As you can see in the diagram below, a typical organic semiconductor will have an electron affinity of about 2.8 electron volts. Um, in order to allow for a very small barrier, you can choose low work function metals like calcium or magnesium, but those are highly reactive. Using a less reactive electrode like aluminum, however, already results in a large injection barrier. The community came up with a solution to this electron injection problem as shown in the conventional deposition, deposition sequence in the left diagram. Um, after an electron transport layer is deposited, a lithium fluoride layer is typically deposited, followed by the cathode. Um, 
what's believed to happen is that the hot aluminum being evaporated onto the lithium fluoride layer causes a chemical reaction that surface dopes the electron transport layer and enhances electron injection. The community, however, tried a very popular electron transport material known as ALQ3 in the inverted sequence shown on the right. And many of the early papers showed very poor results with inverted OLEDs. Um, however, they made the conclusion that the inverted cathode sequence itself was to blame instead of the specific choice of electron transport material. And uh, my work began when I decided to try higher mobility electron transport materials to see if those would allow for um, efficient electron injection, and that turned out to be the case. And after much optimization, um, we arrived at the device shown in the upper left corner, which we later published. As you can see, um, very smooth JV curve and uh, very low turn-on voltage of about 3.4 volts. Um, the current efficacy that we measured from this device, 108 candela per amp at 100 candela per meter squared, was twice that of the previous state-of-the-art devices that had been published, so we were very excited about this. The next breakthrough in our work uh, came from the realization that this particular architecture um, was amenable to stacking. So the last classification of OLEDs I'd like to cover is the so-called single unit versus stacked OLED. A single unit OLED is shown in the bottom left graphic, and a stacked OLED is just a vertical stack of multiple single unit OLEDs uh, connected by a connecting unit. And the advantage of a stacked OLED is that at any given current, you will get a multiplier of the amount of light you get out, the multiplier given by the number of light emitting units that are stacked, where a light emitting unit just consists of an electron transport layer, an emissive layer, and a hole transport layer. Getting more light at any given current provides a operational lifetime advantage because the degradation um, of OLEDs scales with the current that's put through them. Uh, also, these stacked OLEDs allow you to very easily stack light emitting units of different colors, resulting in um, an efficient way to mix colors. And I'll show you how you can make a white OLED um, by mixing different colors in the next uh, couple of slides. But first, here are our stacked green OLED results that we published. Um, we stacked two of the single unit green OLEDs shown on the left graphic uh, vertically with a lithium fluoride aluminum HATCN connecting layer as shown in the right graphic. The JV curves are shown in the upper right. And in the bottom right is the luminance voltage characteristics. In the stacked OLED case, We've also, in a third device, not shown, added an optical outcoupling layer of 120 nanometers of a material known as alpha MPD to get additional light extracted from the device. And here you can see the current efficacy values plotted versus luminance. And I'd just like to draw your attention to the uh, red area of the table below, where at 100 candela per meter squared, we're getting a current efficacy of about 205 candela per amp. And uh, this is actually higher than the highest current efficacy reported for a two-unit conventional stacked OLED. So we were very excited about that. And in the bottom right graphic, you can see some stacked OLEDs that we made on flexible corning willow glass as um, one e example application of these inverted top emitting OLEDs. And the last thing I'd like to show you are some inverted stacked white OLEDs that we later published. Um, we can take a light emitting unit with uh, the blue phosphor FERPIC and a light emitting unit with the, red, the orange phosphor, rather, um, iridium MPQH3, and vertically stack those to produce stacked white OLEDs. And here's the performance of these. The JV curve is shown on the left. Um, luminance versus voltage and current efficacy curves shown in the upper right. And again, I'd like to draw your attention to the table below with the current efficacy value of about 30 candela per amp at 100 candela per meter squared. Um, these aren't the most efficient white OLEDs ever made, but um, it certainly allows room for further optimization. 
So to conclude, the first major breakthrough of this work was finding an efficient way to inject electrons from the cathode of inverted OLEDs. This opened a new route for studying inverted OLEDs for the potential use in high-definition displays. Um, these inverted OLEDs currently define the state of the art in terms of performance, and their architecture allowed us to create the first stacked inverted OLEDs ever demonstrated uh, with these stacked inverted OLEDs combining the advantages of being inverted in design, top emitting, and uh, having a stacked architecture which has lifetime advantages. And finally, I'd like to give some acknowledgments to uh, people and entities without whom this work could not have been conducted. First and foremost, Professor Bernard Kiplin, um, Applied Materials and Solvay R&D for providing funding at various stages of the work, the National Science Foundation, the Department of, en of Energy, the Department of Agriculture, and former and current members of Bernard Kiplin's research group that have uh, assisted in various ways. Thank you for your attention.